Hey everyone, I'm Josh, back with Cardboard Chronicles. Today we have sort of a special episode. I'm talking with Brendan, and we're going to be talking about some of the counterfeit stuff that we've seen in the hobby. Uh, I don't, Brendan has a ton of experience in this area, and he's been helping me a lot, actually, with this. So I'm happy to have him on and help everyone out with the counterfeit stuff and just get, get some more um, information out there, and we'll just have like a discussion about it. So how's it going, yeah, Brendan? It's going well. How you doing? I am doing great. Today is kind of a somber-ish topic, but I feel like it's the most important, important thing. one. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. All right, so why don't you just start us off, though, and we'll you know, get to know you a little bit better. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about a little bit about your collection and uh, sure. what got you started in the hobby. Um, so, yeah, growing up, uh, my dad had a big baseball card collection. Um, but by the time I was born, it was kind of all you know locked away in the closet, so I was never really exposed to it. Um, but I remember once we went on a you know vacation to North Carolina and he took me to a card store and bought me a 33 Gaudi Common. And that was my first, that was my first baseball card. But um, it didn't really spark an interest in baseball cards because, you know, I didn't know the vintage players and I had no means of, of getting any more of those cards. Um, so it wasn't until about third grade that I actually started collecting. And I remember it was a very specific night where it started. Um, I was over at my friend's house. And the year was 1996, and Kobe was, you know, rookie. I live in Los Angeles, so you know, I was a big, huge eight-year-old Kobe fan. And uh, his dad comes home with a box of '96 Flare Showcase, and we divvy up all the pack. You know, his dad was super cool. He let me keep, you know, whatever whatever we opened, we got to keep. So we divvied up the packs into three piles. Um, and I remember I went home with Kobe rookies and I actually, I have a card here that from that break, this Jordan row zero, Dang. um, which, you know, I didn't even know as a kid, I just thought it was a regular Jordan card. It wasn't until I was older that I understood the significance and really appreciated how cool it was for this, you know, my friend's dad to let me take it home. Um, but yeah. And then, so after that, it just every birthday, every Christmas box of cards, pretty much spent a lot of time at the card store. Um, and then, you know, I did, the, I did the whole thing where I dropped out of the hobby for a while. And when I got back into the hobby, I was actually only interested in vintage baseball cards because growing up, that was, you know, what my dad collected. Those were the cards I thought, you know, adults collected and they were the cards I could never afford, you know, the Babe Ruth cards, the Lou Gehrig cards. Um, so for me, they were always kind of these legendary mystic cards that I could never procure. So as soon as I had some money and I was in college, those were the cards I started buying. And unfortunately I wasn't buying the cards from my youth, which would have been a much wiser investment at the time. Um, but yeah. And then my, you know, my nostalgia kicked in around 25, 26. And that's when I went back. I remember actually I went back into my mom's garage to pull out my old collection to see like what I had. Cause I couldn't even remember. I hadn't looked at anything um, in years. And I remember sitting on the, the washing machine going through a, a you know, one of those long card boxes and going through a stack of Skybox premium base cards. And then all of a sudden a Ruby popped out. I'm like, what, what the hell, you know? And as a kid, I'd pulled it out of the pack and just thrown it in. It, the cards were still <laughs> arranged the way they were when I opened the pack, you know, wow. still just, little. I was just like, Oh, this isn't, you know, this isn't Kobe and it's not one of the inserts I'm chasing after. So it's worthless. So right. I found that card and that that's what really sparked you know, my interest in modern cards again. And that's when I started collecting rubies and then platinum medallions. And then, yeah, here I am. Here so we are. I, you sent me your flicker before and we spent like 30 minutes just me looking through it. But what, what all do you collect? You have a lot of, a lot of different stuff. Yeah, it's weird. I don't really have like a focus. I'm not a player collector. There's not like a, you know, I haven't, I'm not disciplined. I'm more of like a magpie, you know, where I fly around and when I see something shiny that appeals to me, I, you know, I bring it back to my nest. Um, but for me, I mean, because I, I always think about this story, too, uh, when because, you know, people ask me all the time, why the hell do I do this and why do I collect what I collect and all that. And uh, I, I think about this story that I heard an author who was being interviewed about why why she collects books, you know, on her bookshelf that she's never going to read that, you know, she's already read. Why, why do you still have these things? And she said, you know, this bookshelf represents me. You know, when I look at this bookshelf, I feel like I'm looking into a mirror. Because all these books represent different facets of my personality, and that's kind of what I what I do, you know, how I feel my collection is. It, it sort of is a reflection of who I am and all of my interests, you know, and all the 
you know, not just the players I like or the sets I like, but, you know, I have, I have weird stuff like, uh, you know, I'll show you this. This is one of my favorite cards here. It's a, it's an art to art card from the 1994 Simpsons skybox set, you know, um, because I love the Simpsons. It's not even a sports card, but as soon as I found out that this card existed, I had to have it because I love the Simpsons. It's a, it's a card. It's a, it's a Simpsons expressed in card form, you know? So when I have my box of cards, you know, with Simpsons cards, Pokemon cards, 90s basketball cards, I feel like some, someone looking through that box could get a pretty good idea of who I am, you know, when I was growing up, what my interests are, you know, so that's kind of how I approach it. I've never heard it explained like that, but that's probably my, my favorite explanation of why you collect what you like. That's awesome, dude. Yeah. I, I love the Simpsons too, by the way. That's yeah. It, it's so like I, you know, when I was a kid, I, uh, I would buy Skybox Simpsons cards when I couldn't afford that's basketball cool. cards. You know, when I'd go in with 75 cents in my pocket, you know, I could always afford a box, a pack of Simpsons. I didn't even know there were cards in there worth owning as an adult, you know? So as soon as I found that out, I was like, oh, hell yeah. You know, that has to be part of my collection. That's crazy. So, yeah. Which, what was the rubies though? I have to know. Uh, it was a Tyrone Hill. Oh, I actually have, yeah, I have it here. It was not, it's not in good shape. Uh, it's in my Flickr though. You was, know, he, box. was he on the Suns at the time? He was, uh, oh God, what is he on? Hold on. Let's. You look it up and I'll get the other next thing, right? I have it right here. It, he was on, he was on Cleveland. Oh. At the time. Yeah. I think you had another Suns player in there and I'm, I'm mixing him up with my brain. Yes. McLeod. George yes. McLeod. Sorry. McLeod. Yeah. All right, so I'll start us off with the fake stuff now. Sure. So probably like, I don't know, what was that, like four or five months ago that I I had purchased a 97, 98 Penny Hardaway Rubies um, on eBay, and I really didn't think much of it. It was just like, it was an auction. The prices was, were pretty high, so I figured, you know, this is legit, and it was kind of like a, uh, I had the money at the time, and I just, I bid on it, and I won put it in my Flickr. I hadn't heard anything for a while. And I think, trace me back to that thread, but I think you, you had made a thread about some research you'd done with that it set. Kobe specific, Bryant card. That was posted on eBay, right? Yeah. So it was the same card, but you had posted, um, and it just sort of like got you researching more and more. And then I was already like a little bit nervous about the card. And then I saw that thread and I remember I was at work and I was just like, oh crap. Like <laughs> I like yeah, went home. feeling pulled it out. Yep. My like heart sank. And I totally, when I got the card, I totally felt like, man, this feels kind of crimped on the edges. And you had said that. Oh, that's interesting that you noticed that. Yeah. Before you had said I've that. I've never held, I've never held a fake in person. So I, you know, I'm, I'm always going off the pictures. So it, it's, it's interesting just, that you can corroborate that. It felt too uh, rigid, I guess. It, it mm -hmm. didn't feel soft, you know? Right. So right. when I saw you say that, that was like, oh, why does, like, I had this sinking feeling like yeah. my card totally feels like that. And then you had the serial number stuff and I was like, damn it. So we started talking and um, it was a total nightmare return, but I was still within the window of PayPal and I think it took like three weeks to deal with Didn't PayPal. And... Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. They kept jerking you around. I remember that. Well, the guy obviously selling fakes, he knew what he had. So he was, he was going to fight it and uh, I had gotten it graded with Beckett and PayPal's like, we don't know what Beckett is. And I was like, you kidding me? Like this is their their sole purpose is to tell you when there's fakes. And I was super annoyed. And I finally just like called one night for like the 80th time. And I was like, someone at PayPal helped me out here. And the guy got, was on the phone was like, yeah, I know what Beckett is. Yeah, you're good to go. Here you go. Thank and God. Just, he just hit the button and was like, Oh, I got my money. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's actually good advice for people, you know, when they are trying to return these things or they are trying to do with PayPal or eBay or even PSA is like persistence really matters and getting sure. the right person on the phone who can actually understand it. But even then, I remember once I, I went to the post office like five years ago, and I was I, it was actually when I was sending that my Mickey Mantle card to get graded, and I insured the package for like five thousand dollars, and the person behind the counter was getting very suspicious because they were like, "What's in here that's worth five thousand dollars?" And I was like, "A baseball card." And they're like, "Baseball cards aren't worth that much. Like, there's you know we can't insure this for that much money." You know, they thought I was trying to scam them basically. Um, so it just goes to show, you know, a lot of people don't even know that baseball collecting is a thing or that they're even worth money or, you know, so. Sure. Yeah. It's almost like, I think I was even like emailing PayPal links to what Beckett is. And like, they asked me for like their cover letter with like, PS to prove. I was like, PS what are you talking about? Just go to their you site. Know, yeah. And PSA is on the NASDAQ. I mean, it's a publicly traded company. Like, right. 
but then but then it's almost like they're they're more willing if you if you give them a letter from some notary you know from some autograph expert you know they're ironically they're more likely to take that if it's signed by someone and notarized by someone even if they're just some right. yahoo who doesn't know what they're talking about they're more likely to take that over the opinion of this company they've never heard of you know which is insane to me because that is literally their entire purpose i, yeah. I said that in the email to them like this is literally their purpose is to authenticate cards. They're like, the gatekeepers. I know everybody's yeah. all into like the high grades and, you know, the condition grading side of it. But to me, the authentication side is the first and most important part of it. Like first, yeah. make sure it's real. And then we'll worry about, you know, the rarity and the price and stuff. Yeah. Um, so can you tell me your side of that whole story? Like you saw yeah, the so, you saw the Kobe and then. Went well, because I wanted to buy the Kobe. Like that was just my thing was like, um, I, I, I knew at that point the team skybox subset there was already information on those fakes um but at that time i think the kind of general consensus was that those were the only cards from the set that you had to really worry about um and so when i saw the kobe even before i saw where it was coming from or anything about it i just got this really weird gut feeling that something looked and felt off um which incidentally is you know when i tell people you know, what should I do when I'm, you know, buying these high-end cards? That's the first thing is to listen to your gut. Um, if anything feels off. And then, you know, I saw it was coming from Taiwan, and then that was another red flag. So, so a few red flags right off the bat. And then it became, but, you know, I didn't have anything specific. I couldn't point to anything specific. I just could only say I have this vague feeling that something feels wrong, you know. And at that point, it becomes kind of like a scavenger hunt. It becomes finding, well, what is the, what is the difference, you know, um, it's like, you know, one of those, one of those like I spy games, you know, or like where you have those two pictures and there's just one slight difference and you have to spot it. And so, you know, it just was a matter of looking at each individual element because I knew, you know, I, I come from vintage baseball and fakes in vintage baseball are super common and they have been for a long time. And every vintage collector is very wary about fakes. You know, that was the, that was a big surprise for me when I first came into modern collecting is how trusting everybody was and how naive everybody was about the idea that people would fake these cards and that they could even fake these cards. Um, but I remember from vintage collecting that there's no real such thing as a perfect fake. You know, there's no perfect replica. There will always be something different about it. And it's just a matter of finding that difference and hoping that the difference isn't too subtle that you can't notice it, you know? Um, and fortunately with the Kobe, with that star Ruby, there were plenty of big red flags. I mean, as soon as I looked at the stamping and, and, you know, I screenshotted them and zoomed them up and put them side by side and a would them. And it was just so obvious right away. And then it was just a matter of trying to find all the other issues with it, um, to just kind of corroborate, you know, the issue. And I found the, you know, issue with the team logo and everything else. And so, yeah, that's kind of how it happened. And then from there, that's when I started getting a lot more skeptical and started looking at any set that was coming out of Taiwan. And basically what I was doing was every, every time I saw a listing, I would try and find something wrong with the card. And a lot of times I couldn't find anything wrong with it, but every now and then I would, and I'd be like, okay, here's a set I can't trust. Or, you know, here's a new, another player that, you know, they're faking. And yeah. yeah, when that happened, someone posted like, why would they fake Penny Hardaway? And I was like, why would, I mean, everyone knows to fake Jordan and Kobe and Penny is the next most expensive. And he still, he still gets almost as much money as those players anyway. You know, he's right up there with players like Duncan and, you know, kind of the second tier. Yeah. It makes total sense now thinking yeah. back. Um, and then you sort of like became like the, like the godfather of like the counterfeits just with the thread. Like, did you get a lot of people reaching out to you and asking for help and, yeah. And I've told people too, like I, you know, cause I don't want people to feel timid about asking questions or feel stupid for asking questions about, you know, I, I'd rather, I'd rather you ask the question before you buy the card than buy the card and then have to, you know, figure out how to return it, you know? And so I'm always open to people messaging me and asking, you know, before you buy something, Hey, do you think this is real or Hey, what do you think? Um, so I do get, you know, I still get messages from you. I get messages from other people all the time. People who've had cards in their collection for a while who get suspicious of it. Uh, people who want to buy cards. And so, like I said, I'm more than happy. My thing though, is that, um, I, the one thing I've stopped doing is, is going into detail about why the cards are fake, um, mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. Um, because as much as I want to help other collectors, that information is also, 
you know, useful to forgers who are looking to improve improve the fake, you know, the next iteration of fake that they come up with. So sure, yeah, that's a that's an important part. Um, so then the next story, this is like a for me, it's like a fool me once kind of thing, fool me twice. So uh, I was super embarrassed when this happened, but I feel like it's important to share the story because it kind of it might you know make other people out there feel like, hey, I've been. Yeah. I'm not the only one that's been duped or I don't feel like and an you idiot, shouldn't like feel you said. embarrassed, man. Everyone, you know, it happens to everybody. And this it's, one, it's... this one was, you know, like, so this one, uh, I, first of all, I thought, you know, you and I had kind of cornered like rubies. We figured it out. And then I sort of got like safe in the fact that I knew what to look for in certain sets. So then I like turned my eye towards the other sets that I didn't know about. Feeling of false security. Exactly. So the PMG championship, someone had posted like, Hey, post your favorite PMG or something. I think it was Grant Slayton that posted. Uh, and someone had posted like a kind of a grainy, weird picture of two penny PMG championships. And I was like super, uh, in the hunt for that card at the time. Oh yeah. I'm sure as soon as you saw you had two, you were like, so I was like, Oh perfect. I'll just buy one. of Right. So I yeah. messaged him right away and he was like way too eager to want to sell. Um, but I found out he was from Taiwan I turned an eye to that because I was just so excited. He had one that was a BGS nine, and I thought, "Hey, this has got to be legit, right?" I yeah, BGS uh, knows by now, right? They figured it out. So, so I I scanned it. I compared them, kind of rough, and I think I I don't remember if I'd asked you about it. Yeah, I sent you. A you message. did ask me about it, and I remember the message you sent because I looked at them too, and I remember the pictures weren't very good. They were kind of shot at an angle. You know, they weren't actual like scans. Right. Um, so it was difficult to look at the details and. I will say the the PMG fakes are so much more sophisticated than the Ruby fakes. Like they really up their game. Like the stamping is so much more accurate. You know, every, all the little details are more accurate. Um, so when I was li- when you sent me those pictures, first of all, I had no reason to believe that they'd moved on to this set. Um, and second of all, I wasn't able to, based on the pictures, to determine that they were fake conclusively. But I do remember saying that I had a, I had that kind of gut feeling because it was coming from Taiwan and because he owned two of them, it just felt a little that, that sort of too good to be true, you know, sort of thing. So while I wasn't, but my thing is if I can't identify a fake, I don't want to, I don't want to like mess up someone else's sale by, by, you know, making people think their card is fake. You know, that's, sure. a, that's another, that's the flip side of it that I don't want to be responsible for it. You know, I don't want to sure. have a false positive you know, and someone can't sell their card because I've said it's fake. So I only ever want to speak out when I feel very confident and I'm really not, you know, when I know that, you know, I I'll, I can have PSA back this up if you submit it and all that. So sure. that was kind of my thing with you was I didn't want, you know, I told you, I think that I kind of had a weird gut feeling about it, but that I couldn't, I couldn't say they were fake. Um, yeah. And then you, I don't know what happened then. So when I got it, I didn't feel weird when I got it. For, I mean, that's probably mostly because it was in the BGA case and it's like so encapsulated. You can't even like, but it, it, I mean, I forgot about it. I didn't, you know, it wasn't like it took me on this search sure. where I was like, I'm going to start researching these cards now. I just was like, ah, oh, whatever. It's probably real, you know? Right. And I felt like it was real. I had shown some people. I was pumped about it. Um, but I never quite felt a hundred percent about it just because of where it came from mostly. And the guy wasn't the best salesman uh it was harder to work with him yeah but i will i wanted to add a point that um you were saying like you don't want to uh reach out necessarily and come out with information unless you're 100 percent sure one thing i'd add to that though if i don't feel 100 percent good about a card i actually like hate having that card in my collection it's this really weird feeling where you're like i know i had the same feeling i'm five percent sure it's fake I'm, I'm like 95 percent sure it's real but that five percent makes me like not want to look at it it's the you know you're just like man can this i can i tell is... you a quick story real yeah. quick yeah this is you were gonna ask me this later but i'm i'm gonna say this now because it, it goes off exactly what you were saying the reason i i even got interested in fakes is because i myself was a victim once when i was a kid um and it actually is the thing that caused me to stop collecting yeah. for a long time so i was telling you you know when i got older my interests was always in vintage. And I remember I was uh, 14 years old. It was, I think, 2002. I'd worked like my first summer job and I had I had like a couple hundred bucks to spend that I knew for 100% I was going to buy a, a 1930, 
or I wanted to buy a vintage Babe Ruth card. Um, and even for a couple hundred bucks, even back in 2002 on eBay, it was hard to find any Babe Ruth card for that amount. The only real card open to me was the 1948 Leaf Babe Ruth. And I remember waiting and waiting for the right auction. And finally, um, there was, there was a, there was like some seller, uh, <clears throat> selling a, a Jackie Robinson and a Babe Ruth card. And, um, they, the description said they'd found them at a state sale and they couldn't be sure that they were real, but that they looked real and that they had no reason to believe they weren't, you know? And so I'm like, Oh, this is perfect. This is exactly what I need. Like I'm going to get a good deal on this. And sure enough, I got the Babe Ruth for 70. And I remember the Jackie Robinson with, ended at 90 and that was too high for me. You know, that was more than I could spend. So, um, so I got the Babe Ruth for 70 and I was so excited. It wasn't in good shape. You know, the back had been torn off of it, which again, is a bad sign with, with vintage cards because a lot of people do that to hide the fact that the back is fake. So I take it to my, you know, my local card shop and I'm so excited. I'm like, you know, I, I'm like, Mitch, check this out. Like I got a, I've got a real Babe Ruth card. And he's like, where'd you get this? And I'm like, I bought it off eBay. You know, they, it was someone who found it at a state sale. Like, and, and he just shook, I just remember him shaking his head. He's like, you know, yeah, this is 99% chance this is fake. And I was like, oh, I was devastated. And I went home and it was like you were saying, he, he didn't tell me for sure it was fake, right. but he, when I told him the story, he was just, you know, shaking his head and I couldn't look at that card. I had the exact same thing with you with the penny because I had that seed of doubt in my mind. I could never enjoy it. I didn't even put it in a case. It was sitting just in a penny sleeve in a drawer somewhere. I remember like even bending it, you know, to kind of see if the card stock was really cheap. Like I just, I just trashed it. And then when I got here, here's the, here's the twist, the funny twist to that story. So that, that feeling always stayed with me. I remember what it's like to be duped and to be fake and to have a fake in your collection and how terrible that feels. The funny twist to this story though, is that when I was in college and I was submitting, you know, bulk like cards, you know, 75 tops cards for $5 a card. I remember stumbling on this, the Babe Ruth card and thinking, you know what, what the hell for $5 just to get, just so I can be absolutely sure that it's fake. And then sure enough, it comes back in an oh. authentic holder. <laughs> but you can see, you know, the back's all torn off. You know, someone, I remember even thinking as a kid, like, oh, someone wrote on it after. Why would they do that? Like, you know, the fake, the forger must have done that to make it look more convincing. But I, anyway, I always thought that was a funny story because for probably 15 years, I was so sure that card was fake. Um, but anyway, I'm sorry. I, I, I derailed your story. No, you were, you were talking about that same feeling though of, right. of having a fake in your collection. And like, it's like the telltale heart, you know, you, it's like it's always <laughs> under the floorboards. Yep. I was just going to say, I could like literally feel like the heartbeat of the car. Yeah. Like, yeah I, I knew where it was in my box. Like, it's I don't the telltale even... heart, man. It, it totally is. It haunts you. Yep. Now like I'll thumb through my cards. Like I do almost every night and I'm like, let's skip that one and just look at the real ones. Yeah. Uh, but my redemption story is that I, I did buy another one. Um, uh, and you got your money back for that one. I got my days. money back for both of those. Oh, yeah. this, so the second one, let me, yeah, let me finish the PMG story. Yeah, that was, so the PMG, I got it. The serial number looked perfect. Like everything looked great. And the serial then, numberings on those are really good. By the way. Even in person, I was perfect. like, it had like the almost shimmer. Perfect. You remember how we were talking about like the shimmer? Yep. Like there's, so I saw that and I was like, dude, this one's money. Yep. Uh, but I still had that like 1% like unsure feeling. And then, a couple of people were messaging me about the seller and then you posted the, another thread about a whole lot of fake cards. I think some of them are rubies. And then you're like, I'm also now wondering about this PMG championship and you showed the logo and I, I came home that day and looked at the logo and was just like, Oh my God, here we go again. Yeah. So this time, like I really didn't want to deal with a return with this guy. So I had already had it sent. I sent it to PSA and was like, I kept it in the BGS lab because I wanted to see like maybe they'll, um, you know, they're supposed to still look at it through the BGS case, but maybe like, right. so PSA came back, uh, it was a BGS nine, it came back PSA eight. So now I'm like 99.9% .9 sure. I'm like, no, this is great. Like, but, you know, it looks good. Um, PSA says it's good. Uh, no, your thread came out after that. Sorry. Your thread came out after that. So I was like, oh crap, this might actually be fake, but PSA just said it's real. So then you and I got in contact with uh, Joe Orlando at PSA and I, I talked to him directly and then he sent me off to a VP. We're talking to him. Yeah, Steve. 
Steve, yep. So then he's like, yeah, send me the card. We'll take a look. Uh, I understand your concern. I sent him like a bunch of information. Here's all the stuff I've seen. Here's like, you know, high, high def, you know, high rise pictures, skins. And then I, I think you would probably message him at that point as well. Yeah, it was funny because when I messaged him, I think he was a little suspicious at first that you might have submitted a card you knew was fake in order to like get them, you know, to grade it and then be liable for the, you know, the price or whatever. Cause sure. they were very suspicious about the fact that they had just graded the card and they were being told it was fake. You know, it was like, why did you submit a card that you knew was fake? And I was trying to explain why well, I didn't submit the card, you know, my friend did. And, you know, so it was, it was, but I think, I think after a few messages, they figured out that it was legit and it was an issue. And so since like, then they've been very communicative and, but I was like 90, like I said, like 99% sure. Yeah. So at that point, as uh, anyone would be, by the way, anyone, you know, if it's been graded by BGS and PSA and, you know, it's like, what else can you do really at that point? Well, I was really sure before PSA. I just, I just wanted like. I, I, I collect PSA cards, so I, first of all, wanted them all to be consistent PSA cases, but I was like, this will be a double, right? Like, if both of them say it's true, then I, I'll feel a lot better, so that's why I graded with oh, them. It wasn't like... It's like two condoms, man. How could it go wrong? And plus, like, as you know, as a real collector, like, I would much rather have the card than the money back. That's why, you know, I bought it in the first place. I want the card. Yeah, yeah. So it came back true, uh, came back authentic, and then we worked with PSA. I sent them the card. I think, uh, Grant Slayton actually donated some of his PMG championships for them to look yep. at. You'd talked with them, gave them some more information. And then, you know, they took care of that actually. And I, um, I, I hope something good comes of that from their end. Like, I hope it wasn't just like, you know, all bad that they had to, you know, pay out for the mistake they made and, you know, the crap that happened to me having to deal with all that. So I hope yeah. positive well, I comes think, out of that. I think we'll know you know, in, in the coming months, if we see any more fakes pop up in PSA holders, that'll be a, you know, very clear. It's almost like the canary, you know, and the, we kind of got to wait to see what pops up. I don't um, think I've seen many other fakes in PSAs even before that. No, I haven't either. Um, it's all been BGS, but I imagine, you know, people are, these fakes are going to continue being made. People are going to continue buying them raw. And I think while the vast majority will continue to be submitted to BGS, I mean, PSA is bound to receive some of them, you know? So um, I think as long as we don't see more cards popping up in PSA holders with brand new serial numbers, then we can be a little more, a little more comfortable. But at the end of the day, I think this whole kind of debacle has just shown that you can't really rely on anybody else. You know, you kind of have to, as much, you know, as much as, as not having money as a barrier to owning some of these high-end cards, I think not doing your research also needs to become a barrier to ownership. You know, I think if you want to own, you know, a $5,000 star Ruby, then it's, you can't just say, you know, PSA is this real PSA is this fake. You need to educate yourself, figure out why the fakes are fake, figure out, you know, really become very intimate with, with the cards themselves. Just look at them, even just looking at them a lot that's how you develop those gut feelings that something's off. You only you become you become like a chicken sexer. You know that have you ever heard of that thing where like the people whose job it is to figure out the genders of chickens can tell, you know, without even looking at their at their uh, genitalia because they've done it so much even though there's no difference between a male and female baby chick. That's what happens to you when you look at so many star rubies for so long. You can you know, even you don't even have to see the back of the card. You can just see a photograph and you're just like, that looks wrong. You know, it's the same thing with uh, like the PMGs. You look at them, they have this weird kind of embossing thing that just looks, if you've seen enough of them, if you've never, if you've only seen a few, it looks totally normal. But if you've looked at thousands of them and you've looked at them every day when you're doing your searches and stuff, it'll, it'll set off a little red flag in your head. And that's kind of the first that's, the, that's really the most important thing to have is, is, is listening to that voice because then you can do your research and, and figure everything out. But if you don't listen to that voice in the first place, then you're not going to do your research and you're going to end up, you know, with fakes. Totally. Yeah. Especially with this amount of money, like yeah, it's worth your investment. It's up only, front. And it's only going to get worse and it's only going to get harder for companies to keep up, you know? So it's, it's going to, it's going to boil down to a personal thing. And also, using, using other people as resources, you know, using the boards, posting, you know, like I said, feel free to message me about any card, big or small, you know, I'm, I'm always happy to take a look. 
So how do you feel about your communication with PSA in terms of their, uh, what's the word, attention or care yeah, towards this? No, I, I, feel, I feel really good about it. Um, I mean, I, I, I reached out to both BGS and PSA when this happened, you know, basically offering to give them all the information I knew and, and BGS had no interest in it and, and was actually trying to downplay the issue and, you know, telling me that, you know, uh, they, they've got it under control or whatever. And, and PSA was a lot more, you know, they, they messaged me back right away. Joe put me in touch with Steve and Steve, you know, he wanted to meet with me in person and we talked on the phone and everything. And he was very, you know, and, and he, and he said, uh, something that I think is very important that, you know, in, in the future, when these sorts of things come up, PSA wants us to communicate with them directly, which I think is a good sign yep. that they really want to stay on top of this. Um, yep. because they're, they're, you know, they're not just trying to fix their mistakes after they've been made. I, I really got the sense that they want to prevent these kind of mistakes from happening in the future, which, you know, from a, which they should, there's no reason why they shouldn't. And there's no reason really why BGS shouldn't, uh, which is why, you know, I, I understand like, not wanting to publicize the fact that you've graded a fake card, you know, it undermines people's trust in your company. And I like, I don't expect PSA to come out with an article in their PSA monthly being like, Hey, you know, there are all these fakes don't running around, you know, they, they're not, they don't, they don't want to scare people in the market. You know, they want the market to stay healthy. And so I understand that they're not going to go out there, you know, trumpeting this, um, as a big deal. But at the same time, all I can really ask for them is to take it seriously kind of behind the curtain, you know, if we, we, we want it to remain behind the curtains. Like you said, though, a little yeah, bit, like of course. as long as, um, you know, that if they reach out to us behind the scenes through email, that's more important than whatever public thing we get from them. And I, and I will also say this, if you do educate yourself, you know, and, and you do become able to identify these fakes yourself, by all means, help other people but don't publicize the information you found. And I know it's coming from all, all just a place of good intentions. You know, you just want to help people or whatever, but in the long run, you're doing more harm than good, you know? Yeah. It's almost like there was a couple Facebook chats about the PMGs and the rubies yeah. and like the fakes. And I had posted like, I posted something kind of vague, like make sure you do your research. Cause I had, I had purchased a 9899 rubies and you and I were like, yeah, we did all of our research on it. We had the, we knew it was real. So, and then we saw the, you know, the fake 8.5 on that one. And someone had posted like, Hey, yours is fake. I just saw an 8.5. And I was like, you know what? Do your research. I'm not going to like get into specifics. And, and I that's don't. what's, yeah. And that's, what's so hard because the, the first thing people say, when you say this card is fake, they say, how do you know, you know, like whether it's their card, whether it's someone else's card, they want to buy. That's the first question everyone asks. And the answer they don't want to hear is, Oh, I'm not going to tell you. You know, or, oh, sure. I can't tell you it's a secret, you know, like that's, it's just so douchey, but like, you know, it's, it's like a, it's like a teach a man, like I would love to teach everyone how to fish, you know, like the teach a man to fish sort of scenario. But in this case, you kind of have to tell the hungry guy, you know, either I can give you a fish or you can go teach yourself to fish, but I can't teach you how to fish. You know what I mean? It's sort of a weird scenario that I think a lot of people bump up against, you know, and can get kind of agitated by I, but but, some of the, some of the people on the responses, I think I, I PM them directly and like, Hey, I know I came off sort of like vague and, you know, like you said, douchey, but there's a reason I'm not publicizing it. If you want to know more, let me know. But if, if you're actually just, you know, here to claim it, I'm not going to get into the details, but if you're looking at yeah. a, a specific card, we can talk. Yeah. I'll always, if you're hungry and you come to my door, I'll always feed you fish, you know, like, or, you know, I'll, t I'll tell you how to teach yourself how to catch fish, but I just didn't Beyond want to that. get into like, it was kind of turning into like a big, like you said it was fake. He says it's fake. Like the people who are actually the ones invested in these cards and care That's about them. The more, other thing. I want to keep that yeah. information amongst those types of people. Yeah. Well, and then, and then too, like you, it, you know, a lot of people get upset when they find out that their card is fake and they don't want to acknowledge that it's fake. You know, there's a, there's a fake Iverson on eBay right now that you know, the, the, in the description, he's warning people about fakes from China and his card is one of the fakes. You know what I mean? Like, it's just it, people, people, when, when they spend that much money and it, it's not just a money thing too, like, like you're talking about, there's an element of pride, you know, that goes into the cards and there's an element of embarrassment in admitting that you bought something that's fake, you know? And so for people, you know, even when they know deep down that their cards are fake or, even when they suspect a lot of people won't get to the point that you did of even admitting it to themselves. You know, they'd rather, they'd rather sell it, you know, 
get get rid of it and try and get the price they paid for it back, you know, which is really unscrupulous and unethical. But yeah, this is obviously like my most uncomfortable podcast just because I've had two recent encounters and it's like even now having it all settled, it's still like pretty painful. Of course, man. So definitely like I, people- I, I, I think it is important that you're that you're, you know, putting your story out there and that people because people need to know that these stories exist and because that's the only way people are going to be skeptical. You know, sure. is that they hear these kinds of stories. So what advice do you have for not only, I mean, we've gone over a bunch of like how you sort of spot it yourself, how you research yourself, how you spend the time yourself, but what can people do to help the general hobby? That's a tough one because I don't, I, I think it is a matter of everyone just kind of has to help themselves to help the hobby, you know, because if everyone is helping themselves, if everyone is aware of the fakes and everyone's doing their due diligence, then theoretically there shouldn't be a market for fakes. You know what I mean? Now that's unrealistic, but the harder it is for these sellers to offload their cards onto people, you know, the more skeptical people, these buyers are, the, you know, the harder it is and the less incentive these forgers are going to have to keep, you know, doing what they're doing. That being said, I think they have plenty incentive because the prices are so high and all they need is one buyer. You know, all you need to find is that one guy who's not aware that there are fakes or who, you know, just wants to believe in this fantasy that this card is real or whatever, you know, it just takes that one person. So I think realistically, the problem is only going to get worse. I think the fakes are going to get better. I think more sets, you know, if you've noticed right now, they've only pretty much stuck to one or two types of holographic foil. They haven't even branched out. You know, like the like the um, the super rave. I, I don't know what to call it. It's the one with all the little dots on it. Mm-hmm. But that sort of super rave foil is the same foil they're using on the star rubies. You know, they're not faking the series. I can't remember if it's series one or two that has the different background, but they're not faking that one because they're not familiar with that kind of holographic foil yet. It's only a matter of time before they start experimenting with it, though, and they start faking all the cards that use that kind of foil. You know, so. Really, the only like I said, the only way is to do your research beforehand. If you're if you're not capable of figuring out on your own, ask someone else before you buy, so that you know these sellers have a harder time. What about the PMG red and green? I've already gotten some questions on on those. I haven't seen. I haven't seen. I, I think those those are kind of an exception because they use etching, and I haven't seen the the forgers are really comfortable using holographic foils. But I haven't seen them do and, and embossing. They've 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 they emboss their cards not very well, but they are comfortable doing embossing. But I haven't seen anything with etching, and I think it's interesting because, like for instance, they'll fake the uh, Metal Universe Gem Masters, which use the, the same rubies, yep. pattern, you know. Yep, yep. But they won't they won't forge a regular PMG from that set because it has etching. The the Gem Masters aren't etched. They're they have the you know the hollow flow, so. I think the PMGs are actually a pretty safe bet for now because I don't know. I I don't understand card technologies. I have no idea how these cards are put together. I don't know how hard it is. I would have thought it'd be impossible to replicate a Star Ruby. I'm, you know, clearly it's not impossible. So to say that, oh, this set is going to be ironclad and absolutely safe in the future, you know, you can't really say that. But I think the sets that are the most safe are the ones that have any type of etching and, um, and that includes PMGs. That includes, you know, 97 PMGs and 99 PMGs. Um, and those uh, chip on the edges like crazy. So it's like, it'd be, like you said, the crimping feel of the edges. It's going to be really hard to replicate. But I mean, I thought that about the PMG Championship. That thing is so detailed. I like thought the card so itself, too. the front I and back so is incredible. And, I was and just the stamping on it, this, they, they did such a good job replicating that stamping. I found a few points, like a few places I can circle, you know, and even then the differences are so subtle where you can only really identify a fake stamp with a really good scan. You know, like the star rubies, you don't need a high res scan. You can just take a photograph at an angle and tell pretty quickly that that's a fake stamp. Not so with the PMGs and the pattern looks good. The, the embossing is a little off, but that that's easy to hide with photographs and, you know, so yeah. I, I think, like like we're saying, it's only going to get worse, and and you just have to be your own kind of soldier. Uh, I wanted to touch on something Nat and I talked about a little bit. Mm-hmm. He, I tend to agree with him. I want to see what you think, though. He thinks that the prices of the real stuff will actually be in the long run helped by the fakes, 
just because it's even now harder to find the real ones and you have to spend more time more research you have to it only works if there's a way to identify the if there's a way if there's a very clear cut way to separate real from fake you know as long as cuz i agree with him like the and and the idea that fakes are cropping up lends credence to the idea that these things are really special and important you know you only make replicas of things that are desirable so i i do agree with him that that I actually think it is going to help the prices of the real thing because people will be more willing to pay for the peace of mind. I think provenance, like he was saying, is going to like provenance in vintage cards is incredibly important, you know, and, and vintage baseball memorabilia too. If you have a Babe Ruth autograph, but you don't have any provenance for it, you'll, it, it'll go, you know, you get a lot less money for it than if you can say, you know, I can trace this ball back to the getting, you know, when Babe Ruth signed it at the clubhouse and I have a photograph of him signing it and look, you can see the stitches on the ball match. That kind of provenance gets you a lot more money. And that never existed in modern parts. That sort of, you know, provenance wasn't important. You, who cares? Now being able to trace a card back to identify where it came from is incredibly important. So for instance, you know, that uh, Iverson Ruby that's on eBay right now. One of the reasons I was able to so easily identify that as fake is because I was able to trace that back to that card being sold from Taiwan just a couple months before, you know? And so that card now has a very, in addition to looking and all that being fake, it now has this kind of a toxic provenance, you know? Um, It's the same, like there there are vintage baseball, you know, memorabilia that come out of certain people's collections that people don't want to, you know, like Barry Halper stuff. No one touches that. You know, if it comes from his collection, it's toxic. So that's going to start happening um, more and more with modern cards. And you're going to start hearing more and more about who owned this card, you know, whose collection this card was in originally. Oh, this is the card, you know, that Nat Turner had in his collection. Or this is the card that, you know, Grant Slayton bought back in 2000. You know, and what he was talking about with Flickr with timestamps too, and the serial numbers on uh, on cases using that to, you know, identify when it was graded and all that. Those sorts of things are going to become much more common. And I, I agree, we'll, we'll increase the price unless we get to a point, like I said, where you really can't distinguish between the two and there becomes no, no discernible difference. And then we're in trouble. Yeah. And that's, and that's kind of like the point of no return. Hopefully that'll never happen because my philosophy is that there is no such thing as a perfect fake, that there will always be some difference that you can never replicate something truly exactly, you know, or we will be dead by then or, or it's all over. You know? <laughs> or, yeah. It'll be, it'll be end times. Yeah, I, man, I'm just like, it's painful thinking about the fakes, dude. It just sucks. Yeah. Um, but, but I think it is manageable. I think, you know, it is a cancer, but it is something we can kind of live with and, you know, and, and still have a good quality of life. We don't have to euthanize ourselves. It makes the hunt, one positive note, it makes the hunt even a little bit sweeter in a weird way, you know, like I have the real one, I've ha- especially now that I'm going to have the rubies real, it's going to be like, Yes, like your Ruth, right? It's you probably like that more than you would have if you had the seventy dollars. Absolutely, it's so much more special to me having gone through that roller coaster. Right, you know, to have it now. The, the like, more, in general, the more, the more obstacles that are placed between you and a card, the sweeter it is to finally get it. You know? totally. And that's with any, that's with anything in life. So really, the fake thing just is is more obstacles to overcome, and will just make victory all the sweeter. You know, when you finally taste it. Yep. All right, man. I'll wrap it up, but. One last time, if anyone needs help with this, please reach out to me or Brendan. Uh, I'll, I'll post your information on the in the description if people want to PM you on Blowout. Um, this has been great, dude. Thanks for your help. Yeah. yeah, it's been great. Thanks for having me, man. See ya.